All right, welcome to the Chapter 7 video series. This is Dr. Johansson. Even though you cannot see me, I haven't quite figured out how to get this all to work. Um, I will be writing on the slides. Um, these PowerPoints are posted in this week's module. There are three different videos. You can see what they're covering here. Um, these videos are designed to help clarify some of the more challenging topics, but they are not covering all of the learning objectives or all of the text. So these are just supplemental. All right, so the first topic I wanna to talk about are membrane lipids and how we go about studying them. So you know that phospholipids are the predominant lipid in cell membranes. So those up here, and those are the ones we learned about in general biology, particularly the glycerol-based phospholipid. So remember, a phospholipid has a charged head, and that makes it hydrophilic, water-loving, and the fatty acid tails, remember, are these long tails of carbons and hydrogens, and so they're very hydrophobic. Okay, so we're adding to your lipid knowledge. So another common um, type of lipid in animal cells is something that's based off of sphingosine. So sphingosine, as you can see over here, has its own long fatty acid or carbon hydrogen tail. Okay, this one has 12 plus the carbons around it. And so we just add one fatty acid to it, whereas opposed to glycerol-based phospholipids, we're adding two fatty acids. But the end result is the same. They're going to look like a polar head with two fatty acid tails. Glycolipids, glyco instead of phospho, means that it has a sugar as the head. Okay, and sugars are also polar, so it still has the same general structure. But instead of the choline and phosphate, you're now getting galactose. The rest of it's the same, sphingosine and fatty acid, or glycerol and two fatty acids. You do not have to memorize structures. You should be able to recognize something like this as a some kind of lipid, phospholipid, um, is usually what I'm looking for uh, because that's the pr most predominant one. Um, but if there was a, said there was some kind of sugar, you would know it's a glycolipid. <clears throat> the other main type of lipids in membranes are sterols. Um, especially cholesterol, <clears throat> excuse me, in animal membranes. And so to recognize a cholesterol or a sterol versus a phospholipid or glycolipid, you see this ring structure. So you should be able to recognize one structure versus the other structure. Okay, this is not <clears throat> very hydro, uh, hydrophilic. Like for instance, cholesterol only has this small OH group that gives it a little bit of a polar um, characteristic. The rest down here is all hydrophobic. So as opposed to the lipids in our membrane that have this big polar head, um, cholesterol has a very small polar part. I also want you to notice this is kind of a fat molecule. So it's going to take, whoops, it's going to take up space in the membrane. So one of the techniques we have for studying lipids is thin layer chromatography or TLC. Okay. So we are separating molecules based on 
polarity. Okay, so how much charge or how little charge they have. You may have done this in a general biology class with um, leaf tissue and uh, pigments. So we did thin layer chromatography in the general biology class um, I used to teach. And you separate these pigments based on how polar or nonpolar they are. So this is the same kind of idea, except that instead of using paper, it's a glass plate that is coated with a very polar substance. That means that as you are separating things from your mixture, the stuff that is most polar, the molecules that are most polar are going to move slow because they're attracted to that coating on the plate. The other important thing to know is that we put this in a liquid called a solvent and that solvent is going to be nonpolar, which means <clears throat> the more nonpolar a molecule is, the further it's going to move because it's interacting with the solvent more, the liquid, and not with the polar coating on the glass plate. So you can separate molecules based on their polarity. <clears throat> Excuse me. So this is a picture from your book. What I want you to understand is your origin this is your mixture. So maybe you isolated some membranes from plants or from animals, and you're going to look at the different types of lipids in there. So you put your plate into the solvent, which is blue in this case, and you can see it's moving. <clears throat> Cholesterol, we just talked about, is very hydrophobic, so less polar. And in this case, phosphatidylserine is more polar, more hydrophilic. Okay. Now I want you to note that you could reverse this. You could make the coating of the plate nonpolar and the solvent polar, and everything would move in the opposite direction. Okay. So always watch what your solvent is, and that will tell you if it's a nonpolar solvent then the nonpolar molecules are going to move further. Now, when you're recognizing this as data, what you're going to notice, because we're going to go through SDS page in the video too, is that when we separate things on gels or on thin layer chromatography, we always get these things called bands. Now these bands look kind of like blobs, but all these different lines are representing different types of molecules that have been separated. So the way you can tell what technique is being used is by what we're separating. So I would need to tell you, okay, we're separating some cholesterols or some lipids, just by looking at the image alone, you wouldn't be able to tell what kind of technique this is. So always be looking for what we're separating, or you're going to see with SDS page, if you see something um, designated with kilodaltons, we're talking about proteins because that's how we measure the size, sizes of proteins. So don't get stuck on band looking or band colors, okay? Look at what we're separating and then you know the technique. Second technique I want to make sure you understand is FRAP, fluorescence recovery after photo bleaching. And we learned about photo bleaching in unit one. And so this is showing a series of images and just so you know, ROI means region of 
interest. And this technique is to measure movement of molecules. So you can measure movement of molecules in a membrane. You can measure movement of molecules, in this case, inside a cell. What this image is showing you is the green is called green fluorescent protein. And this, so this cell um, in the pre-bleach <clears throat> has been made to express GFP all over. And then what they did was they actually zapped the nucleus, right? So you're using a laser light to bleach and you basically destroy <clears throat> the fluorescent molecules so that they're not glowing anymore. And then you wait and you see if things, other molecules, other fluorescent molecules will move into this space. And so in this experiment, they were asking the question, can a green fluorescent protein move into the nucleus through the nuclear pores? And in fact, it could, because you see that the place that was bleached now has green protein in, in it. So you're measuring the movement of molecules. You're really looking at the movement of the non-bleached molecules. Okay, so we can't um, follow these ones that have been um, bleached or the fluorescent has been destroyed. All we can visualize is that other fluorescent molecules were moving in. Okay. So this is just a diagram to try to illustrate what's happening is in here the blue are the ones that are still fluorescing, the blacks are moving out, the blues are moving in. Right. So you've got movement, and this is a nice way to illustrate um, the fluid mosaic model, right? So that membranes, you understand, are not static. Everything is not in one place, but the proteins and the lipids can move around. So think of it like a globe that you can take and move your hands around. Well, the proteins and lipids can do the same thing. They can move around that cell exterior. What they have a hard time doing is flip-flop or transverse, where you flip from one side of the membrane to the other. But as far as moving laterally around within the membrane, they can do that very easily. Photoactivation, we also talked about in Unit 1, and I bring it up here to contrast with photobleaching. And in this case, you are stimulating fluorescence. So you lose, use your little laser light fluorescence. I'm a horrible speller, so I apologize. Um, so what this is showing you is that they excited some molecules here, and as time went on, the molecules moved over here. So in this case, you can follow the activated molecules. So here is an image of um, part of a cell where they activated molecules here, and then as time went on, the molecules diffused. Okay, so photoactivation, um, Photo bleaching very similar in what they do. It's just one, you're watching the movement in photo bleaching of the other molecules, and in photo activation, you're watching the movement of the ones you activated. Okay, the last technique I want to talk about in this video is freeze fracture. Okay. So this is where you freeze a cell and you whack it with a knife and you are basically splitting, oops, sorry. I have to be careful where I put my hands when I write. 
you are splitting the bilayer into the two monolayers. These are also called leaflets. So you've been reading in your text about how the lipid composition of the top and the bottom leaflet can be different. You also have been reading about how there are proteins embedded in that membrane. And so when you crack it open with freeze fracture, all these little dots or bumps represent proteins. And if you look at the pictures, they're pretty complicated, and I will not ask you to be able to identify the extracellular layer versus the cytoplasmic layer. What I want you to understand is if you look at pictures like this, I would want you to be able to say, okay, membrane two has a lot more proteins in it than membrane one because it has more bumps, right? They've done some pretty cool science using freeze fracture, and I just want to show you that over here, that this is the nuclear envelope, and we'll talk about that in a couple chapters from now. And they split it, and you can see these big divots. So these are way bigger than these little bumps, right? There's a lot of other little bumps out here. These are nuclear pores, and they actually allow for transport of proteins in and out of the nucleus, as well as um, messenger RNA. So there are cool things you can see, but you really need to be uh, an expert at freeze fracture to um, be able to pick out cell parts. So this is what I want you to be able to recognize. More proteins, less proteins. And that brings us to our last slide for this video. Um, this is a table from your book, and I want you to understand that this protein-lipid ratio helps to distinguish different membranes, okay? So the two I think are, are easiest for us to understand because we know a lot about these membranes is you know that the mitochondrial outer membrane, its main function is to transport um, pyruvate in, right? to get things into cellular respiration. This is the outer. The inner membrane, hopefully you remember, has the electron transport chain, ETC. And so all these dots I'm drawing are all those proteins that line up in the inner membrane of the mitochondria and allow us to make ATP. So it's not surprising that the inner membrane has a much higher protein to lipid ratio than the outer membrane. And so all these numbers tell you is relatively, wow, this has a lot of proteins in it. The myelin sheath has hardly any proteins in it. And you can see around two is a pretty standard um, level for different types of membranes plasma membrane, less, right? So you're not gonna calculate this. You're going to, I want you to understand it when you're comparing something, so relative. So a higher protein to lipid ratio means more proteins in that membrane. All right, that's it for um, video one, and we will come back and start talking about analyzing proteins. Ooh.